It's always a very sobering thing to preach God's Word on the Lord's Day uh, behind a pulpit that's being entrusted to you. Uh, with what I do for a living, I speak all over the state all the time. Don't get nervous. Um, Rick Burgess has me teach at Man Church. While it's teaching the Bible, it's not on the Lord's Day behind a pulpit. It's just going and talking about how to be a better father. Don't get nervous. But when I preach, even here at our home church, um, it's a sobering thing. And so... Um, with that, I want to just kind of jump in. Uh, the, the title of my sermon uh, this week is on covenant faithfulness and stealing from God. So real quick, just want to lay out some of our distinctives at Reformation Baptist Church so you kind of know where I'm coming from as I go about this. Uh, if you've been in the new members class recently or have, have joined us in that, uh, we talk about these distinctives. If you go on our website, the three C's of the distinctives are there. Um, but we kind of added two more as we talk in our membership class. And so Reformation Baptist Church is a Reformed Baptist Church in the historic tradition. We hold to the London Baptist Confession of 1689, and our distinctives are, as I just said, the London Baptist Confession of 1689, we are confessional. So we are covenantal, we are Calvinistic, we are patriarchal, and we are family integrated. And so confessional, what does that mean? It means that we hold to the 1689 and also the, the Baptist faith and message. That's a, that's a tongue twister, Baptist faith and message, uh, 2000, um, and, and other historic confessions. But those are our two primary ones. And the reason for that is that everyone says that they believe the Bible. No creed but Christ. Well, that's a creed. When you say no creed but Christ, that's a creed, right? So anytime you say this is what I believe about the Bible, you are now creating a creed or a confession, and Mormons say they believe the Bible, Jehovah's Witnesses say they believe the Bible, okay, um, Pentecostals say they believe the Bible, and I think they, the, the, the Pentecostals probably do in their own way, but we would read it and believe it differently, and so we're saying this is how we see it. So we confess and we actually believe that by stating clearly what we believe, we actually create unity in the body by doing that. We are covenantal. We believe that God has revealed himself to man and interacts with man through a series of covenants. There are two kind of what I would call meta-narrative interpretations of the Bible. There's dispensational and there is covenantal. We are a historic reformed church who holds to a uh, covenantal understanding, not a dispensational understanding of the Bible. And that governs so much of what we believe, um, but I'm not going to get into that until a little bit later. Calvinistic, we believe that God is sovereign in salvation and hold to a historic reformed view of soteriology. Patriarchal, we believe that God, excuse me, we believe that in God's good design in the creation order, he has made man to rule in all three spheres of government, the church, the home, and the state, or the civil government. We're family integrated. We believe children should be brought up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord, and we believe that responsibility lies primarily with the household, so we order our church accordingly. So a lot of people, when they come to Reformation Baptist Church, it's different than a lot of the other churches you go to. Well, there's five ways that we're different than probably any church that you can go to around here, right? Um, but we believe by clearly stating this is who we are, this is the direction we're going, this is what we believe, and people understand that and they come here, and they say, I like that. I believe that's what God actually wants from me, from my family, from us, from the church. And, and we're going to get on board. So we state those things up front. And I'm going to dive into one of these. I'm sure you guys have heard a lot about all of these with the exception of one. I believe that one uh, that is less known about, and there's no way I could do a full treatment on it today, uh, is the covenant theology aspect of what we hold to. It is a big deep subject of interpreting the Bible through the series of covenants and their different administrations and all of that. I'm not going to do a full treatment today, but I am going to touch on it. I have touched on it in previous sermons, and I'm just going to touch on it a little bit more. As I learned about covenants, it was like I had to learn in layers. If I tried to read all of everything about it, my eyes would just start to spin, and I'd be like, uh, and so I would learn a little bit, get it, and then I'd go another little bit deeper and just go like that. And so I'm going to bring out a little bit more of that. So and I believe strongly that the deeper we understand the nature of covenant, the deeper our relationship with Christ will be. So covenant theology primer as given by the Continental Congress. Weird, I know. Follow me. So I realize the American War for Independence isn't the usual source to quote for covenant theology in a Sunday sermon, 
But the system of government we found ourselves in prior to declaring our independence was one in the vein of medieval feudalism, which was heavily influenced by a covenantal understanding of authority that came from the historical interpretation of Christ's relationship to the saints, God's relationship with Israel, and also historic authority structures. It was just the way, when, whenever there was authority, that was just the way it was forever until about 1776, okay? And then there was some stuff in Rome and everything else, but uh, this medieval feudalism, um, when I began to read about it and saw it and saw that it was really uh, at the heart of the founding of the United States of America was a covenant with the King of England, it began to help me understand the nature and structure of covenant. So, um, and as I began to understand that nature and structure of covenant at a deeper level, uh, it helped me to lead a more faithful and fruitful life as a believer, as a husband, as a father, uh, and as a member of the church and also a citizen um, in this state and nation. So let me explain. The English feudal system or the medieval feudal system was a governing system between a lord and his vassals, a lord and his vassals. It was entered into through a covenant. Jesse Sumter writes of this system, quote, this was a blood oath which required both parties to take their responsibilities and duties seriously. Work, property, families, and life itself depended on this oath. The Lord had the, so in this relationship, there's the Lord and there's the vassals. The Lord in this relationship had the authority to tax, to issue the death penalty, and to call to arms. He also had the responsibility to protect his people and ensure peace for them. The vassals, this, uh, the, the ones under that authority, in turn had the responsibility to pay dues to the Lord and submit to him for the peace of that society. In essence, this is the most basic understanding of how God issues authority. To the one he gives authority, he gives the responsibility to protect and provide order for those under that authority. To the one under authority, he requires submission and obedience in exchange for that protection and provision. You can see this pattern in marriage, okay? We go all throughout in Ephesians where it says, um, wives submit to your husbands, okay? What he's saying is, and, and I walk through this all the time, when your uh, father walks his daughter down the aisle and that father's responsibility is to provide for her and protect her, and he hands that authority off to a young man when they get married, and now it's that young man's responsibility to provide and protect her. And God says, because that is, he, I'm giving this young man authority, and now he has a responsibility that comes with that authority, and what I require from the wife is to submit to him and obey. Slaves, submit to your masters. It's the same thing. The, 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 again, here's, a, here's one, a little, little uh, YouTube clip that's going to take Brian down. Slavery from the Bible. Um, but it was not chattel slavery. It was not um, man stealing and everything that happened with the American slave trade. Back historic biblical slavery was this idea um, that a person who didn't have means to be able to feed his family would go to a wealthy landowner and say, hey, I'm going to work for you. And in return, you're going to provide for my family. And so the, the, the master had a responsibility to protect and provide for that person in, response, in, in return, he submitted and worked, okay? And so that was the nature of that relationship. This is just the way that God's authority structures work, okay? And covenant is no different. So in a covenant relationship, there are requirements on each side, requirements on each side. Failure to fulfill those requirements were grounds for consequence and eventually if the requirements continue to not be met, the dissolution of the covenant. The colonists were considered Englishmen and were given all the rights and responsibilities of Englishmen under the authority of the King of England. The King of England was the Lord and the colonies were the vassals. The rift that led to the colonies to declare their independence was not high taxes as we are often told, but it was a dereliction of the king's responsibility to protect the colonies and provide peace, order, and an environment where they could flourish. He failed to fulfill his end of the bargain in this covenant. King George was not faithful to the covenant. 
Where taxes became a problem was that King George had allowed Parliament to wield increasing amounts of authority over the colonies, which included higher taxes to pay for wars they weren't involved in, and the British military to be stationed in the colonies. There were British colonies all over the world, and the vast majority of them had parliamentary representation. The American colonies were not afforded this representation, but were still taxed and ruled abusively by Parliament, and this is where we get the term taxation without representation. So it would be like if the federal government was taxing us and we didn't have our seven, seven Congress people going to Washington, D.C. to be our voice. Not like that's doing a great job, but that's neither here nor there. But the idea is that, that you, would have a vo you would have a say in what's going on in the Congress. The Parliament operated like the Congress of England, okay? And so the Parliament was taxing us and ruling us and abusing us and doing all these things, and we had no representation. And so that's taxation without representation. King George did not intervene on behalf of the colonies to defend them from these abuses, and this abdication was just one of many that was the grounds for the colonies declaring their independence and dissolving the covenantal bounds that joined them to the king. The Declaration of Independence was a long list of injuries and usurpations that essentially showed how King George had broken the covenant and in doing so gave the colonies the right to remove themselves from the covenant and create their own system of government. Let's read a little bit from that declaration. It's, it's really interesting once you understand this feudal system, this covenant nature, and you go and read the Declaration of Independence, it's just dripping with this idea of Christian authority, okay? It's really interesting. All right, so I'm not going to read the whole Declaration of Independence. That would be a whole sermon in itself. But the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth a separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. You have, where has the king broken his covenant? And it's interesting that the writers of the declaration understood that the causes for the separation should be written out for the sake of mankind. What does that mean? Basically saying anyone for all of history who looks back and questions why we separated from England needs to see where King George violated this, cover, this, this covenant so that they would see that the United States was just, uh, that these co the colonies were just, and they understood that. They didn't know they were going to win, right? It, it could have just been a thing they could have thrown in the Declaration of Independence when we got wadded up and through, but, but we won, and now it's kind of a big deal, right? So, a little bit more, the history, this is from the Declaration of Independence, the history of the present king of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations. These are violations of the covenant, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world, okay? Thomas Jefferson goes on to list 25 ways in which the king of England violated his covenant oath with the colonies. Here are just a few. He has kept among us in times of peace standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. Another, for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without consent. Another, for depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury. And finally, uh, again, this is only, I think, four that I listed of the 25. He has plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. It goes on, and the ending of the Declaration, I believe, really puts a bow on the covenantal nature and imagery of what's happening. I'm not going to read the whole thing. You're welcome. Um, in every stage, but I'm going to read a little bit more because I, I think it drives the point home. In every stage of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. This is important right here. Our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of a free people. So they sought time and time again repentance on behalf of the king. They didn't whimsically just say, I don't like what he's doing. We're our own. We're, we're going to go to war now. We're going to do our own thing. They understood that, that the, the, the weightiness of this relationship and that it was actually a good relationship when it functioned as it was supposed to. So they sought time and time again to resolve the issue by writing to the king. The last attempt was called the Olive Branch, written in 1775, where the Congress wrote saying that we wish nothing more ardently than the restoration of the former harmony between England and the colonies. 
They relentlessly sought restoration through a request of repentance by the offending party, but their pleas fell on deaf ears. It's important to note that they weren't whimsically trying to burst the bonds of authority. And then it, declaration closes with, we, therefore, the representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions, do, in the name and by authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are, and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are, here it is, absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. That historic covenant is now gone. They declared. And they go on and obviously say a bunch of other stuff, and then I have to read my favorite part. Uh, where it says, and for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And that's how it ends. So, the colonies appealed to the supreme authority, God, to dissolve the bonds they had with an earthly authority. Our founding was based on the dissolution of a covenant, arguably one of the most important political documents in the history of Western civilization, is a list of ways in which one of the members in the covenant was not fulfilling their requirement and that that failure was grounds to separate. If you look back at the theology of the devout Christians in and around the time of our founding, the Puritans, which is where you look back at the English Civil War and you look at the Puritans and all those things, this is where our political thought derived from. It was all steeped in Christianity, right? And, and of course, now they go back, George Washington was a racist, they weren't actually Christians, okay, whatever. Go back and read it and look, look at it for yourselves, okay? They understood deeply covenant theology and they understood deeply what was happening here. So now that we see the nature and structure of covenant clearly in the way that our nation was founded and our relationship with England was dissolved, I wanna take that lens and apply it to our relationship with God. Genesis 17, 7, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. Exodus 6, 7, I will take you to be my people and I will be your God. Does that sound familiar? Lord and his vassals. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you. Oops, wrong one. I will take you to be my people and I will be your God and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burden of the Egyptians. Ezekiel 36, 28. You shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers and you shall be my people and I will be your God. Jeremiah 7, 23. But this command I gave them, obey my voice and I will be your God and you shall be my people and walk in all the way that I command you that it may be well with you. Jeremiah 30, 22. And you shall be my people and I will be your God. Jeremiah 31, 33. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. This is how God interacts with mankind is through a series of covenants, okay? And I'm not going to get into the, you know, Adamic covenant and going into the Abrahamic covenant and the Mosaic covenant and the Davidic. I'm not going to get into all that today. I'm just showing you the nature and structure of covenant and how God interacts with us. So here this pattern. This is the pattern that we're going to use for the rest of the day, okay? Or the rest of my uh, short but probably too long time up here. Um, I will be their God, this is the pattern, I will be their God, and they will be my people. Obey my commands, that it may go well with you. This is, this is the basis of the covenant. I will be your God, you will be my people, obey my commands, and it will go well with you. Okay? He is our Lord, and we are his vassals. He will provide for us and protect us, and in return, we are to obey him. Here is the primary difference between us and the colonies. The covenant they were under that they dissolved is a covenant with an earthly temporal ruler. The covenant I'm speaking with is with an eternal king. Our Lord is perfect, so he will always fulfill his end of the covenant perfectly without question. This covenant is not with King George. There will be no fault in this covenant on the part of the Lord, but only on behalf of the vassals. 
We are the only ones that can be unfaithful to the covenant, and when we are, he will correct us, and oftentimes, it will not be pleasant. Again, I want to reiterate that in a covenant, this is key, there are requirements for both parties. That is what a covenant is. There are requirements on both ends, okay? That means upon your profession of faith and your subsequent baptism, you have entered into a covenant with King Jesus that comes with requirements. That's icky to say, okay, in our society. Think of the Great Commission through that lens. What is the Great Commission? All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded or to obey all that I have commanded. Another way of saying that is, All authority in heaven on earth, and again, he's saying, I am king of kings, I am lord of lords, I am the ultimate covenant authority in the universe, in the cosmos. All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Go and make disciples of the nations and bring them into covenant with me and teach them to be faithful. Okay? That's what it's saying. Bring my enemies into covenant with me. What is evangelism? You have the great king of the universe who has come and paid the price. He shed his blood. He died. He was put in a tomb and rose from the dead and ascended into heaven where he sits at the right hand of the Father, righteously ruling over all things. He is a king, and everyone is, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's how the story ends, okay? But the process of that happening is us going and saying, hey, guys, there's a new king, and you can either be his enemy and he will crush you, or you can enter into this peace covenant with him and you can obey him. That's on you. I I suggest this one. But if not, that's up to you, okay? We, so when we submit, we are at war with King Jesus as sinners, and in his goodness and his graciousness and his great mercy, he opens our eyes to who he is and who we are. And we feel the weight of our sin and we're driven to our knees and we confess our sins to him and we enter, we we profess that he is who he is and we are baptized and we are brought into covenant with him. And the terms of that peace covenant so that we are at peace with him comes with um, uh, covenant requirements things that you have to do and things that you can't do. And if you sign a mortgage, like I don't know when you guys get a mortgage, you get that stack of paper that nobody reads. It's like all the terms of the covenant, right, in the mortgage. Well, here, there it is, the terms of the covenant, okay? So, anyway. <clears throat> Another way of, uh, excuse me, how, how do, so how do we make a disciple? We hear the term, we need to go and make disciples. We need to go make disciples. We need to go and make disciples. Well, what does modern evangelicalism do? Dunk them, baby, and move on, right? And dunk them, move on. No, that's not what it is, okay? Make disciples. Making disciples is to baptize them on the profession of their faith and teach them to obey. Everyone forgets to teach them to obey. Made a disciple, gone, and they have no idea how to keep covenant now, Okay. So another way of saying that is bring them into covenant with Christ and teach them to be faithful. Bring them into the covenant and teach them to be faithful to that covenant. That's what discipleship is. What is covenant faithfulness? I think this is key in understanding. It is not perfect covenant obedience, but it is the pursuit of it. It is the pursuit of it. Our hearts long to obey our heavenly Lord because he gives us a new heart that wants to obey him upon our salvation. Our hearts long to obey our heavenly Lord, but in our sinfulness, we will fall short. And when we do, as quickly as possible, we confess our sins and turn back to Christ. It reminds me of Romans 7 where Paul is like, all the things I want to do, I don't do, and all the things I don't want to do, I keep on doing. This is the Christian life, okay? Okay. Your flesh is at war with your spirit and your spirit with your flesh. And so you are going to be imperfect in your covenant obedience. But what is imperative is that as the moment you realize that you have been unfaithful, that you hit your knees and you confess your sins and you're forgiven. John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
It's interesting that the description here that God is faithful and just, these are covenantal terms, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Covenant faithfulness on our part is striving to obey and confessing our sins and repenting when we fall short. Covenant faithfulness for him, among other things, is forgiving the sin confessed and repented of and cleansing us from all unrighteousness. This is part of that covenant relationship. Let's take a look at the historical definition of sin and see how it stacks up with this conversation. This is really interesting. Um, and again, the people who wrote um, the 1689, the people who wrote the Westminster, the people who wrote all of these historic things, they, were co- they had a covenantal lens in how they did everything. Listen to this. This is the definition of sin. I almost want to ask Charles to come up here and do it because this is one of his catechisms. But the Westminster Shorter Catechism, question 14, what is sin? Sin is any want of conformity to or transgression of the law of God. What does that mean? Wait, question 15. What does that mean? What is meant by want of conformity? Not doing what God requires. What is meant by transgression? Doing what God forbids. What is sin? Not keeping covenant. Not doing what's required of you as a Christian. And then doing the things that are forbidden of you as a Christian. That is literally the definition, the historic Christian definition of sin, is not doing what's required of you as a Christian or doing that which is forbidden as a Christian. So this definition implies that God and his covenant relationship requires things of us. This is completely foreign to modern evangelicalism. God not only requires things of us, but he also forbids other things. You go and preach that in most churches, he just committed legalisms, okay? Obedience is not legalism. Obedience is not legalism. I almost want everybody to say it and we can chant it, okay? Because we're so steeped in this silly modern evangelical Christianity that is a standardless Christianity that does not preach about what is required of you and what and, and those things in which you can't do. Everything is a matter of conscience and you just go about your life um, and, and that's what it is. That, that is a standardless Christianity that does not produce saints, it does not produce disciples. <clears throat> Obedience is not legalism. When we fail to do what is required, we are failing to uphold our end of the covenant. Remember the pattern. I will be their God and they will be my people. Obey my commands that it may go well with you. So that is our pattern. When we fail to do what is required, it implies that it will not go well with us. Okay? Do what is required, it will go well with you. Don't, well, it's probably not going to go well with you, okay? So there is some debate on whether there are curses in the new covenant for unfaithfulness. I believe that they are. That might surprise you. But either way, the structure is the same. Obey and be blessed. Disobey and be cursed. Okay, you don't think there's curses. Great. Obey and be blessed. Disobey and be corrected. Principle's the same, okay? These covenant curses or corrections, either way you interpret it, are meant to lead you and drive you to repentance. That is not to say if something is going bad in your life, it is automatically because you haven't been faithful. God uses trials to grow us. James 1, 2 through 4, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. However, the Christian life of obedience provides plenty of adversity that God can use to grow a saint without calamity. Ask a stay-at-home mom. Okay. God ordinarily grows his saints through faithful obedience. You live the Christian life the way that you're supposed to. It's really hard. That's why no one wants to get up and preach what you're actually supposed to do as a Christian is because it's not fun and it's hard. It's beautiful and it's sweet and it's glorious, but it's not easy. And so in that difficulty of your covenant faithfulness, obeying him in every aspect of your life, it's extremely challenging and he grows you. But storms will come. And it doesn't automatically mean it's because you're unfaithful to the covenant. However, I will say that if it's not going well for me in a meaningful way, I typically check in with God and I'm like, be good? Like, did I do something here? Let me look at all of the areas where you're, you require me of things and see where I'm messing up. That's wisdom, okay? Um, 
But again, the, the things do happen. God does bring storms. He does grow us in the ways that he sees fit. Nothing, um, how does it go? I'm going to blank out up here. That's the worst when you're up here and you completely blank out. God doesn't allow anything to happen to you that isn't for your good or his glory. Okay? Everything he allows to happen to you is for his glory and the good of his people. Right? That's extremely comforting. All right. <clears throat> So there is no neutral with God. Either you are faithful and you are blessed, or you are unfaithful and it will not go well with you. Okay? Being in covenant with Christ means there are requirements of you. You are required to do some things. Okay, we covered that. Um, when we violate that, we must repent and seek to be brought back into fellowship with God. If we continue in our hard heartedness, if we continue in our hard heartedness and fail to repent, we enter into unfaithfulness and can rest assured because our Lord loves us that it will not go well for us in our lack of repentance and unfaithfulness. This is his good design. So, I'm, I'm being repetitive on purpose, okay? Obey and be blessed, disobey and be cursed. There is no clearer instance of this in the scriptures than Malachi 3, 6 through 12. For I, the Lord, do not change. That's a key portion, portion of this scripture, okay? I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed, from the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. You've been unfaithful. Return to me, and I will return to you. Fulfill your end of the covenant, and I will return to fulfilling mine. But you say, how shall we return? Will man rob, <clears throat> will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need, I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all the nations will call you blessed for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Another pattern that you will see in God, God says, if you disobey me here, you will be cursed. And it's this short stabbing thing and then he says, but if you obey, and he goes on for like seven verses of all the blessings. So which do you think he prefers? He doesn't want the curse. He wants to bless, but he's faithful and just, okay? And another way you see that is he says he will visit the iniquity of the fathers onto the third and fourth generation. Well, that's scary. But what does he say about faithfulness? To a thousand generations. He will bless them to a thousand generations. He will curse them. And so you see, curse is meant for correction, but the desire is to bless, and that's the pattern, Okay? Withholding your tithe is stealing from God. It is a violation of the covenant. How can one withhold their tithe and then expect that it will go well with them? <clears throat> but on the flip side, God says that if we do tithe, we can put him to the test. This is the only area in the Bible where God says, test me. Put him to the test and he will open the windows of heaven for us and pour down for us a blessing until there is no more need. This is not health and wealth. I'm not Benny Hinn. I'm definitely not Creflo Dollar, okay? That's not what this is. This is God. This is his word. And he is saying, put me to the test. <clears throat> he will rebuke the devourer so that our fields will bear fruit. This is a clear picture of the structure of covenant. Unfaithfulness brings curses. Faithfulness brings blessing. Not just financial blessings, but covenant blessings in every realm of our lives. Tithing is not the only area we see this, but this passage could not be more clear, and it's the area I want to zero in on for the rest of our time. So what does this passage in Malachi mean for us in the new covenant? Let's get back to the pattern. Remember I said we'd get back to that? Continue going back to it. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Obey my commands that it may go well with you. He is our Lord, and we are his vassals. We are in covenant with King Jesus as our Lord. Our king is the king of righteousness and peace. He is the priest king in the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 7 is a long chapter, and I'm not going to read all of it. I'm going to jump and skip around a little bit. I encourage you to go and read all of it. Okay, I'm not jumping and skipping to pull things so that it, it makes me read the whole thing. 
okay? It is an entire chapter on who Melchizedek is. People are like, well, it doesn't say much about Melchizedek. And they're like, well, there's a whole chapter, actually, more than a lot of other things get. All right, <clears throat> for this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And to Abraham, <clears throat> and to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He is first, by translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. See how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. Let's jump down to verse 14. For the one whom these things are spoken belong to another tribe from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that the Lord was descended from Judah and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about these priests. Who was the tribe that served at the altar in the old Mosaic covenant? Levi. Okay, Jesus was from Judah. How can Jesus be a priest? If Jesus was from Judah, because he is not a priest in the line of Levi, he is not a Levitical priest in the Levitical priesthood, which ended at the end of the Mosaic Covenant with the nation of Israel coming to an end, okay? He is a priest forever in the line of Melchizedek. It is a different priesthood. <clears throat> this becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And then in verse 22, this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant. The guarantor and the mediator of the new covenant. Jesus is prophet, priest, and king of the new covenant. He's a prophet. A prophet speaks to God's people on behalf of God. Who does that better than Jesus, where Jesus is the word, okay? He speaks to us with authority on behalf of God. Christ is the word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 14 in John 1 says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. God speaks to us through his son, who is the word made flesh, Every good Reformed person will tell you if God told you something, oh, so you were reading your Bible? No, 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 God didn't know. God, God speaks to us through his, through his word. Who is the word? The word is Christ. Christ is the word made flesh. So he is speaking to us as a prophet through his word. Is priest, Christ is the lamb of God. He made the ultimate sacrifice, appeasing the wrath of God as the once for all propitiation of our sin. And he mediates on behalf of the saints to the father. He is prophet, he is priest. And as king, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, righteously ruling over all things. The nations will be his inheritance of the increase of his government and peace. There will be no end. He is prophet, he is priest, and he is king of the new covenant. He is our Lord and king to whom we belong as vassals. Let's go back to Genesis where the pattern of Abraham to Melchizedek is set. Genesis 14, 17 through 20. After his return from the defeat of, this is the hardest name in the Bible, and I read names up here all the time. I don't, I don't got this one. Chedorlaomer. That's what I'm going with. <laughs> After his return from the defeat of that guy and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet with him at the valley of Shaveh, that is, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine, he was priest of God most high, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram most by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. After Abraham routed the pagan kings who had captured Lot, Melchizedek, king of Salem, came forth and served Abraham bread and wine, in response, Abraham gave Melchizedek a tithe of the plunder he had won. Galatians 3, 29. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. We are Abraham, 
Christ is Melchizedek. Do you guys see that? Pretty clear. We are Abraham. He is the father of the faithful. If you belong to Christ, you are Abraham's offspring. Christ is from the line of Melchizedek. This is the pattern. As A.W. Pink writes, But not only was Melchizedek there in Genesis 14 a type of Christ, but Abraham was also a typological character, seen there as the father of the faithful. And we find he acknowledged the priesthood of Melchizedek by giving him a tenth of the spoils which the Lord had enabled him to secure in vanquishing those kings. As Abraham is the father of the faithful, so he left an example for us, his children, to follow, and rendering ties unto, whom, <clears throat> unto him of whom Melchizedek was a type. When we gather each Lord's Day, it is in this pattern. We, as the children of Abraham, gather to worship Christ. We are blessed. Bread and wine is given by a minister of Christ's church whose priesthood is in the order of Melchizedek, and in response, we give a tenth of our increase. This is the pattern for the New Covenant Christian worship. Okay? It's amazing to see that back all those years ago, the bread and the wine, the whole thing. It's, it's, it's incredible. So now I want to answer some common objections. Israel's tithes were closer to 26%, so if we're keeping to that, then we should tithe 26%. And typically when you hear that from the preachers that I've heard that from, they're like, if you want to give 26%, go ahead. That's how it's said. I mean, I can picture the, the pastor that says that in, in my head. And well, here's the deal. If the Bible says to give 26%, guess what? We're going to give 26%. But it doesn't. Thank God. Okay? It doesn't. The 26% was from inside the Mosaic Covenant to the nation state, the theocratic nation state of Israel that covered their government, it covered their priests, it covered all of those things. Abraham's meeting with Melchizedek preceded the Mosaic Covenant in the establishing of the nation state of Israel. Therefore, that pattern was set before. Therefore, that pattern will be held after. Okay, the things that God revealed before Israel stay after. That is the historic position. So another thing, well, you know, it was 26%. Tithe literally means 10th. It literally translates 10th. 10th, not 26th, 10th, okay? Abraham's ties to Melchizedek predates the Mosaic Covenant, as I said, in the nation state of Israel, so the pattern was set prior to Israel being established, and, and I've already said that. Okay, another objection. I tithe my time. This is very normal, and again, the point of me coming up here and teaching this is not to slam anybody if you guys have these thoughts in your head. If the church doesn't teach and say this is actually how it's supposed to work, then you don't know Okay, and so we have to teach on these things, otherwise the saints don't know. So I tithe my time. Unfortunately, the power company does not let us pay our bill in the currency of your time. Okay? Brandon cannot feed his family on the currency of your time. I, I wish they could, but they can't, okay? We need to be serving the church with our gifts as we can, but that doesn't take the place of financial tithe based on the increases of our finances. The tithe is on based on the increase. When God increases you financially, you give a tenth of that. It took me well over 20 hours of studying, listening to sermons, and writing to prepare the sermon. When I had a consulting firm, I charged $50 an hour. That'd be $1,000 for this sermon. And I, if, I, if I did that, and I just didn't tithe for the next $1,000 that I felt I owed the church, and I just withheld that, I basically just charged the church $1,000 for me to preach this week, even though Brandon or the finance committee agreed to that. We good? thousand bucks, right? Okay. Another objection. I tithed, to my, I tithed to my favorite ministry or parachurch ministry, or I gave some money to uh, a person who was in need. Great. I'm glad. Focus on the family or grace to you has not been tasked with the shepherding of your soul. And that, that could be Ligonier. That could be insert whatever parachurch ministry here. It doesn't matter. I'm just pointing those ones out. Focus on the family or grace to you has not been tasked with the shepherding of your soul and the administering of the ordinances. I would argue that Christ's church has a rightful claim on the tithe. Abraham to Melchizedek is the pattern, not Abraham to James Dobson. Okay? You can support these ministries. In fact, I encourage you to, but that does not equate to a biblical tithe. That goes for any donation you make to any ministry or struggling person. This is a great thing to do, but it, does, it, 
It doesn't impact your responsibility to give a tenth of your increase to Christ's church. Another objection. By being required to tithe, that takes away the spontaneity of my giving as the Spirit leads. I disagree. You can spontaneously give 11%. Spontaneously, okay? I, that's literally what tithes and offerings. The offerings is the spontaneity. That is as the Spirit leads. The tithe is the requirement. <clears throat> so... 10% is the minimum. As a friend of mine here that disagrees with me on my assessment on tithing, it's okay, we can disagree about things. A friend of mine who disagrees with me on this says that 10% places, 10 is a great place to start, but if we really understood the grace that the Lord has shown us, we should be giving a whole lot more than 10%. I give that a hearty amen. The Spirit of God is not going to lead you to give less than his word requires. I'm just going to keep moving. Okay, objection. Next objection. Brian, the economy is horrible. The cost of gas and groceries is outrageous. I can't afford to tithe. This is where the understanding of covenant and how God works really kicks in, okay? This is where you are going to strengthen your faith more than anything you've done in your Christian walk is when it doesn't look like you can and the spreadsheet says that you can and you say, God, I'm going to trust you anyway, okay? Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all those things will be added unto you. I would tell you that the economy is bad, finances are tight, and you can't afford not to tithe, okay? If you understand how God and covenant works, you can't afford not to tithe. Now is not the time for one of those corrections, okay? Trusting God with your finances will strengthen your faith more than anything ever. And the final thing that's not an objection, just an observation, Brian, every time you preach, you preach on the same thing. Correct. <laughs> Guilty. So for five years, every time I got behind the pulpit, it was, it was a running joke. Nick would see me preaching. He says, family? And I'm like, family? We're preaching on family. For five years, every time I got behind the pulpit, I preached on family and the father's responsibility to shepherd his family. And I would say that you can look around and see the fruit of that focus in our church right now. Okay? Not just because Brian preached on it like once a year. No, but that, that was the focus. That was the focus, okay? Um, Pastor Brandon and I sat down years and years ago and discussed that we felt for the church to grow in health and stature that we need to teach and exemplify the Christian's role in the home, the church, and the civil government. The biggest area that needed to be changed was men owning their role as family shepherds. So Brandon taught on this consistently. Every year we do a men's study with the primary focus being on family, whether we are reading William Gouge, which we'll be finishing up his third book, or before that, it was Vody Bauckham, and I think we read another one um, by Matthew Henry, and just on and on and on. Every single year, what are we teaching our men? Family. Family. I said, you know, year 10, family. Family, okay? It's important. And there's not, there's not the two most covenantal areas in the Bible are family and finances, okay? So, it's also, uh, and it was my job to compliment Brandon's vision whenever he entrusted me with the pulpit, so that's what I do. What it really boiled down to was basic discipleship. The two primaries in discipleship relationship, once you are discipling for me, it would be a young man, once they're praying and reading their Bible, so for a young man, put the porn down, pick up your Bible. That's basic discipleship in this generation, okay? Put the porn down, pick up your Bible, pray every morning, read your Bible every morning. Once they get that, let me talk to you about your family, and I want to talk to you about your finances. That's what discipleship is, okay? And we have to, and, and that, I mean, that's what it is. So God places that covenantal emphasis on these areas. The job of the church, beyond the preaching of the word and the administration of the ordinances, is discipleship. So the job of the church is to teach you how to be covenantally faithful in every area of your life. And those two areas are primary, a church filled with bib biblically ordered homes who tithe is a church that will change the world. A church filled with families who train their children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord is a church filled with families who are covenantally faithful. So it, there's two things that are happening here. One, a church filled with fathers who are shepherding their families, fathers who, uh, husbands who love their wives, men who are men, women who exemplify biblical femininity, okay? and are working as mothers in the home and training their children, and you have children who honor and obey their parents, from a practical standpoint, that makes church a lot easier. 
practically. But from a covenantal standpoint, when you think about when we're being covenantally faithful is when blessings abound. So yes, practically it's helpful, but also covenantally, God's going to pour out his blessing on this church because we are doing that. <clears throat> so a church, um, a church filled with families who honor God with their finances by giving, at minimum, a tenth of their increase is a church filled with families who are covenantally faithful. And so practically speaking, a church that tithes allows us to pay our pastor and have lights and air conditioning. So practically, it's good, but covenantally, it's better, okay? If you have a bunch of families in a church that are tithing, that means that, God, that now you are unlocking this idea of God's blessings on a people. And I would much rather have a church filled with people who are going to be covenantally blessed than a church full of people that are going to be covenantally cursed, okay? <clears throat> a church filled with covenantally faithful families is a church that will reap God's blessing and be the source of future governors, judges, and elected officials. It will be the place God uses to raise up future entrepreneurs and business leaders. It is a church that will raise up future pastors, elders, and deacons for generations to come. A church that is filled with covenantly faithful families is a church that will change the world. It is evident to me that God is preparing Reformation Baptist Church to be something much greater than a little country church in Elmore County. I believe he is going to use this church in this current cultural moment to be an outpost of the gospel in a dying world that will leave its mark on history. I believe that with everything in me, okay? And we can only do that if we are faithful. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your faithfulness. Father, we sing the song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. Father, you are indeed faithful, uh, a covenant-keeping God. And Lord, we pray that by the power of your Spirit, you would help us to be as faithful to you as you are to us. And in that faithfulness, Father, that uh, we would see Christ's righteous rule obeyed in every square inch of our lives, of our homes, of our churches, of our cities, of our states, of our nations. Father, that his rule would be made known. Uh, and submitted to, and in that, uh, blessings would abound. We pray for repentance in our land, Father. We pray for repentance um, from our fathers uh, who are falling short. We pray that they would repent and take up uh, that mantle as a family shepherd. We pray um, for pastors in, in, in Elmore County and in the state of Alabama who are not preaching the word of God in its fullness for fear of losing congregants, Father, that they would repent from that wickedness uh, and that you would restore them, and that the gospel and your word would be preached faithfully. Uh, and for elected officials who have abdicated uh, their authority, that they would use their authority in a way uh, for personal gain and gratification. Um, we pray for repentance there. That as we see repentance in all of these areas, uh, Father, we would see your blessing poured out upon this land. Lord, we love you and we praise you, but our prayer is for the saints of Reformation Baptist Church that we would be covenantally faithful, that we would obey you, and that it would go well with us. In Christ's name we pray, amen.